Um, finally, I ask you to save your questions until we prompt you so uh, you can explore WebEx and find the chat window. And when we get to the question part of the program, uh, you can be entering your questions there and Carl Litke and I will be monitoring those. Uh, so, Cara, let's uh, let's go to the the, the first slide. Um, great. Uh, uh, yes, here we are. So, uh, I want to kick things off by sharing some of the good news. And the first good news is all about you. Uh, we've got some uh, pictures here of some of the home offices of our many Cal's employees, and. Um, I often just pause to reflect on what we're going through now and, and realize that this is probably going to wind up being the biggest professional challenge, or at least the shared challenge uh, that we all experience in our professional lives. And there are many heroes as we go about this challenge. And we would all, um, I think, like to think we're heroes, but we can't all be the healthcare workers who are saving lives or the innovators who are designing new tests or therapeutics. But I know firsthand that all of you are going about your jobs with dedication and compassion and navigating ever-changing policy, policies with patients, oftentimes working longer hours than usual and dealing with your colleagues with caring. Um, and I'm very grateful for that and uh, your, your heroes for that kind of uh, behavior. Uh, these are some of the spaces where uh, we're doing those things. And uh, we've had through countless hours of video chatting, we've been able to see people's second bedrooms and dining rooms and basements, learn about their pets, their families and roommates, and sometimes their hobbies. It's surprisingly ordinary, but it's also inspirational to be able to get these personal glimpses. Um, and I'm going to say that not only uh, do we have a good group of people who are with us today, but uh, we're also finding that there is still a lot of eagerness for people elsewhere to come and join us as potential students and as employees. Uh, we don't have the final number of what our entering student class will be, but uh, so far it looks that it's similar in numbers to last year. Uh, and also at the end of this presentation, Mark Rickenbach is going to be sharing with you some a little bit of news about our faculty recruiting. Um, so let me go on with a little bit more good news. Uh, Carl, let's go to the next slide. So uh, um, where are we with our uh, capital projects? Here we are. Uh, in February, the State Building Commission approved the final funding plans for these two projects. Uh, Babcock Hall Center for Dairy Research Edition and uh, renovation of the dairy plant, which you see on the bottom right, um, and the new Meat Science and Animal Biologics Discovery Building, which will house research supporting the, the state's meat processing industry. Um, and both projects were then approved by the Board of Regents in February, and then the State Building Commission followed. Um, and with those approvals complete, uh, construction continues in earnest, even during this period of, of shutdown. So the meat science building is scheduled for completion in August of this year. Um, and substantial completion for the Babcock Hall project uh, is still anticipated for January of 2022. Um, with MSABD, as we call it for short, uh, the meat science building, uh, we are currently working on recruiting a director and we think that we may be in the final stages of that. And we are planning a grand opening for the building, um, likely in November. Okay, Cara, let's go to the next slide. Um, we are still conducting our fundraising campaign. The whole campaign is 90 months long. It started in July of 2013 and it will end at the end of the calendar year. And uh, together with some things that some gifts that haven't yet been logged, we're at about 96% of our goal. Our goal is 150 million, which was a stretch goal for us. And uh, we're, we're very excited that we're making such great progress. Some recent gifts that have come in since the first of the year, uh, there is another mortgage, mortgage match for uh, faculty chairs, and we are able to snag three of those. 
Uh, and we have a, uh, we have received a planned estate gift of 2 million dollars. Um, and as time goes on, we, uh, for the end of the campaign, we are really focusing on uh, um, the student experience and student support generally. Uh, and the event that's called the day of the badger normally happens in April. Um, it's going to be postponed uh, probably until September. And again, this year we will be focusing on quick start the pre freshman program that's been so successful over the last 2 years. So, Cara, let's uh, go ahead and um, um, talk about the our award winners. So, uh, I'm really excited to be able to announce the Cal's award winners today. Um, we had a lot of impressive nominations and the selection, selection committee uh, had uh, several difficulties in deciding who, who would prevail. Uh, and so I know that everybody uh, who is nominated is deserving and especially the award winners. Um, we will be uh, profiling the award winners uh, in ECALS and celebrating them again at a later date. So our academic staff awards this year go to Kathy Glass from the Food Research Institute, Janet Newlands from Bacteriology, and Greg Sanford from Agronomy. Next, Cara. The University Staff Awards go to Gary Grossen from the Center for Dairy Research, Dawn Wagner from Cal's Human Resources, Joe White from Agricultural and Applied Economics. The Cal's Equity and Diversity Award goes to Rebecca Larson from Biosystems Engineering. The Pound Extension Award goes to Christelle Godot from Entomology. And the Pound Research Award goes to ben Benjamin Zuckerberg from Forest and Wildlife Ecology. The Arthur J. and Ellen A. Maurer Extra Mile Award goes to Dominique Brassard in Life Sciences Communication. The Spitzer Excellence in Teaching Award goes to Michelle Watio in Dairy Science. The WALSA Outstanding Advisor Award uh, goes to Dan Young in Entomology, and the J.S. Donald Short Course Teaching Award goes to P.J. Leash in Entomology. Excellence in International Activities goes to John Roll in Bacteriology. For the, the first time for this award, the first time it's been awarded, the Louise Hempstead Leadership Award goes to Aaron Silva in Plant Pathology. And the Robert and Hazel Spitzy Land Grant Faculty Award for Excellence goes to Kent Weigel in Dairy Science. We have uh, some additional awards. Uh, the Don Peterson Farm Technology Transfer Award uh, goes to Matt Aikens in Dairy Science. And uh, the Alfred Topfer Faculty Fellow Award goes to Valentin Picasso in Agronomy. Fellowships uh, that have been awarded this year include the Campbell Bascom Professorship to Randy Jackson in Agronomy, the Elmer Martin Billings and Jean Hood Billings Professorship in Nutrition to Guy Groblewski in Nutritional Sciences. And the Fritz Friday Chair for Vegetable Processing Research to Brad Bowling in Food Science. The James Crow Distinguished Professorship goes to Brett Pezur in Genetics, and I believe that's also a first time award. The Marvin Beattie Professorship in Soil Science goes to Alfred Hardemink uh, of Soil Science, and again, I think that's a first time award there. The Anderson Bascom Professorship in Agricultural Economics goes to Jean Paul Chavas in Agricultural and Applied Econ. And the Allen Memorial, Memorial Chair in Phytobacteriology is awarded to Caitlin Allen. The Rank Chair in Agribusiness, Agribusiness goes to Xiaodong Du in Ag and Applied Econ. The Vaughn Bascom Professorship in Plant Pathology goes to Doug Rouse in Plant Pathology, and the Rothermel Bascom Professorship in Agronomy goes to Sean Conway. So thank you uh, to all the people who nominated our awardees and congratulations to all of them again. I look forward to being able to celebrate in multiple ways in the coming years, including in person. 
So I'm now going to turn the floor over to uh, Doug Reinemann to talk about some uh, updates in extension. Doug? Thanks, Kate. Um, well, uh, first of all, the field research uh, that has is being conducted by uh, CALS extension specialists has been largely uh, approved and ongoing. So we're able to uh, to arrange for the appropriate uh, risk management with the virus situation and keep most of our vital field research uh, going. Uh, trying to emphasize that work to be done on egg research stations when possible and some extra precautions uh, when that work occurs on private farms. Um, regarding the, the extension faculty positions, we had uh, three new uh, searches authorized, uh, one in uh, BSC, one in agronomy, and one in entomology. Uh, we have advised those departments that they can continue to develop the uh, PDLs for those positions, uh, but we're going to put the, the actual search uh, on a temporary hold until we understand the, the budget implications that, that might occur from the coronavirus situation. And then I'd also say that um, uh, the, I want to congratulate the CALS specialists for the outstanding job they've done on responding to the coronavirus situation. Uh, the Division of Extension has a resource page, and I see the, uh, the Dairy Hub has just uh, launched a resource page on, for questions dealing with coronavirus. Uh, our specialists have been really on the front lines and provided an enormous amount of content in very short order to help farmers and our faculty and staff uh, address the the concerns with the with the virus situation. So again, thank you all for your outstanding work uh, at the last minute, pulling together some really great uh, resources and great programming. That's all I've got right now. All right, let's go to our next presenter. I think that's Bill or Karen, whoever wants to go first. Well, I'll, I'll go next, I guess, follow Doug's extension outreach with the research update. Uh, first of all, it's been a little over a month when we, since we had to scatter like a covey of quail because of the global pandemic. And in that time, I've just been so impressed at the, at the resilience and work ethic and collegiality of all my colleagues in the college. We had to develop a, a process to, to um, approve essential research ongoing uh, with minimal risk from scratch. And in the last month, we have approved over 120 faculty to continue to perform some of their most essential and critical research. You can't do that without the help of great staff, both on the Ag Research Station and folks that are coming in every day, risking their lives to take care of animals and plants. And so I wanna say a special thank you to uh, building managers and plant and animal care staff. Um, everything from fruit flies to African crickets, transgenic mice to dairy cows are all being well cared for as are uh, all kind of irreplaceable plant resources. And, you know, that's not an accident. That, that happens because people really care about their work. They're passionate about it. They're driven and it shows every day. Another thing I'm proud of is the fact that the research division uh, continues to function remotely. We put in over a hundred proposals with you guys help last month and that augurs well for the future. Uh, we're getting just-in-time requests from NIH for some very large grants that hopefully we'll uh, hit on, and that's a positive thing too. So I'm a microscopist by, by trade, and um, I'd like to give a shout out to the biochemistry department. Brian Fox and Liz Wright have just about done the impossible recently in continuing to build 
the new cryo-electron microscopy lab. They've got three top-end microscopes installed and working now, the Creos, the Arctos, and how do you, I'd forget one of them, the Arctica, the Creos, and the Talos. And they're currently working on installing a focused iron beam scanning electron microscope called the Aquilos. And, you know, I've built two electron microscope labs from scratch myself, and to do it in the time of global pandemic and social distancing is, is quite something. So I'd also like to say a big congratulations and thank you to the university staff and FPNM, the folks from Gatan Instrument Company, the Thermo Fisher folks, and again, salute uh, Liz Wright. I, I can't imagine the both the stress, but also the sense of accomplishment you must be feeling right now. And uh, finally, I'd like to congratulate uh, my old pal, Rick Lindreth from Entomology. He was awarded the Hilldale uh, Award yesterday, a campus award in the biological sciences that recognizes the best uh, biological sciences faculty member in the university in their teaching, research, and outreach. And, you know, I'll remind you that the first winner in 1985 was Howard Timmons. So um, congratulations, Rick. That's it, Dean Kate. Let's go to Karen then. Okay, so uh, the update from the academic side. So as you all know, all the courses this spring have transitioned to uh, remote delivery. And courses are continuing, and I really want to uh, thank all of our instructors who have put in a tremendous effort to really pull this off. Um, so kudos to all of them and to all of you who are supporting our students through this transition as well. I want to point out that we've had a great support team, uh, both of instructional designers and uh, technology experts uh, that have um, um, helped transition as much as possible. This is a team that will stay with us through the summer and as long as needed. So um, if you're planning courses in the future and you're worried about the transition, um, please reach out and, and we'll get you connected. Now, most of the reports from students are that they're actually coping reasonably well um, in this remote environment. And um, some of them, in fact, are, are reporting that they actually quite like it a lot. Um, of course, not all experiences are the same and uh, we do have uh, students that are struggling out there as well. So again, uh, continue with all the work that we do in terms of supporting students and um, if you have concerns uh, about particular uh, students again please reach out we're here to help support those efforts as well many of you may be wondering what's what's next uh, in terms of forward looking uh, so in terms of summer as most of you probably already know our summer courses also there will be no in-person courses this summer um, the decision was made in enough time, so we have a little bit more time to transition. Uh, for those of you who have chosen to take our in-person courses online, not all of them, um, not all of our courses will be available remotely. We have the opportunity to make informed decisions uh, for the summer, um, as opposed to the spring when we needed to get all of our courses completed for our students. Um, so this isn't enough time, again, to make fully uh, functional online courses, but we do have more time to be thoughtful, creative, and planful for how to do that. Again, I'll remind you, we have uh, a lot of support on instructional design and technology, so uh, we will be uh, continuing to work in that space. SOAR this summer will also, for the first time, be uh, a, a fully virtual experience. Um, now, many of the SOAR activities are still in the planning stages uh, at the campus level, but I want to assure you that our SOAR leaders in, in the college are, are in those conversations. We'll be continuing to uh, be planning for how to have as full of a college and major experience as possible. I want to particularly give a shout out to Kiva Kopa Aranda and on my team, who is our leader from, from a college standpoint uh, in these discussions. Uh, and really representing our college as well as uh, communicating with all of the uh, majors and advisors and so forth on what this domain looks like. So stay tuned there. We're still, we're still working hard about what that's going to look like. Um, the other thing this summer, uh, we have Quick Start. This will be the third year for our Quick Start program. Luckily enough for us, the foundation course is already an online course, and so we'll be moving forward uh, full Full speed ahead, uh, we have many uh, applications. In fact, we're a little ahead of last year at this point. 
Um, so uh, we're looking forward to that. Now our second part, which is normally on campus, uh, will, will not be able to be delivered in the same way, but we're working hard. Uh, and I, again, I wanna give a shout out to Tanya Cutsworth, who's uh, really the leader in this domain about how to provide all of the top level experiences that we'd like our students to be getting as they transition back to campus, hopefully next fall. Um, so a couple good news stories about what's been going on in this front. Uh, first and foremost, our global health major has been officially, officially approved and will be opening in fall 2020. So uh, this has been a, a, a big effort by lots of people and uh, something that I think we can really celebrate. Again, I wanna acknowledge Susan Paskowitz for her leadership in this area and really pulling this together um, and getting the work done. And also Todd Courtney, who's been one of the uh, key communicators to the advising community and all about what this really means and how to get our students transitioned. So global health major will be available to our incoming freshmen this summer during SOAR and to others in the fall. Um, and we're anticipating in this current climate that a lot of our incoming students are gonna be particularly excited about engaging in the question of global health. On that front, I also think we have many of our students who'll be interested in hearing more about uh, um, uh, COVID-19, first of all, as a, a virus and how it works, and also on some of the society impacts and so forth. And I know that uh, we have several courses across the college that are already starting to uh, um, put this type of material in their current courses as, as examples and so forth. And I look forward to seeing more of that as I know our students will uh, be excited to figure out, uh, to see the connections here uh, with some real life examples. So even in this unfortunate situation, we also have some silver linings. So in particular, I wanna point out how well our instructors and students are really engaging in the use of technology for this remote instruction um, and um, exploring all that it can do. Um, many, I think, have been surprised by the power and strength of, of using these technologies uh, in their courses. And although I know many of them will not stay in a completely remote environment, I know that we will continue uh, to see the strength and use of these tools uh, into the face-to-face -face instruction. So I'm looking forward to that as, as I know our students are as well. And finally, Kate already mentioned this, but I wanna say that, you know, interest in CALS for our incoming students is, uh, remains strong. Uh, admission generally and applications for Quick Start specifically are uh, a little bit up from last year. We don't have final numbers yet. The decision date is at the end of next week. So. Uh, stay tuned, but at this point, uh, things are looking good. We see a strong interest uh, in that domain, and we also have a really fairly strong enrollment uh, for summer as well. So our students remain excited and enthusiastic to come to UW and specifically to join CALS, and um, again, all the efforts across the college by all of you in, in uh, keeping things going and um, uh, making these transitions as smooth as possible for our students is much appreciated. What I have, Kate. Thank you, Karen. Uh, now we're going to go to uh, Mark Rickenbach, who's going to wind up with our prepared remarks. Uh, so uh, you can start reading your questions uh, to put into the chat window. Mark. Thank you, Kate, and good morning, everyone. I, I really want to touch on three things this morning. Um, I want to give a little bit of an update on the uh, CALS climate survey talk a little bit about uh, faculty hiring and where we're at with that, and then maybe spend a little bit more time on wellness and kind of how we're um, working through this um, really um, unprecedented time in our experience here at UW-Madison. So first on the CALS Climate Survey, as I think um, most folks have known through updates on eCALS and elsewhere, is that we were planning to have some pilot, uh, pilot survey go out um, this spring, and um, because of COVID and the remote work and everything else, it just didn't seem right to assess climate at this point, particularly if we were gonna use that as a baseline for how things look in the future. Um, this is unfortunate, but um, we're in the process of, of thinking about how we're gonna roll out the survey come fall. So we will look for the CALS climate survey to be out in um, fall of this year. And Kate mentioned, and Karen also followed up about the interest of students, I would say is we're also having a strong interest for faculty in joining UW-Madison. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So far this year, we've had 12 candidates accept faculty offers 
and this includes three since early March. And I want to say that um, I think at least one of those individuals did not visit the Madison campus or was not able to make a second visit. So there's a lot of interest. And we're also working on another eight offers right now. The accepted offers include positions in life science communications, horticulture, animal and dairy sciences, agricultural and applied economics, biochemistry, genetics, and soil science. So it's really the, a, a wide range of disciplines that are coming that will have new faculty starting either um, this fall or um, some have postponed looking to January instead. But I'm looking forward to having them uh, join us soon. And moving on to the topic of wellness, um, you know, we may be safer at home and we may at some point enter the uh, Badger bounce back phase, but are we all well at home? Um, as Kate mentioned, we are learning a lot about each other, um, our colleagues, our pets, um, our roaming habits. One of the things I think my colleagues note is I'm usually never in the same place for a meeting. Um, so that's just a little bit of my roaming habits when I'm at home. Um, but it's also easy to get lost in our work at home. Um, we lose that separation of kind of time and, and a sense of a, a clear separation. And sometimes that leads us to feel stressed or disconnected from our everyday lives. And we just wanted to, to remind everyone that there's um, there's resources out there to help folks if you're having trouble or um, wondering for some other solutions for maybe how to manage your time and day. And for our employees, and this includes our postdocs, there is the Office of Employee Assistance, which offers 24-hour uh, professional counseling services through uh, Life Matters. And I will post a link to some of these resources in the chat when I'm done speaking. And for our students, including graduate students, we also have University Health Services, which continues to provide mental health services, including a 24-hour access to Silver Cloud and online mental health resource. Um, so there's resources out there. There's ways to get help. Um, please remember in this time, uh, remember to take care of yourself. We've had some really beautiful weather lately, so the chance to get out and walk around, I think, is really important. Um, as a reminder, things should never get so bad that they result in hostile and intimidating behavior or issues in the work for, in the workplace or other types of bad behaviors. Um, the campus rules on hostile and intimidating behavior and Title IX still apply, as does our response to them. I'll also make a, a comment out there to all the supervisors. Um, this is really a time to be there for your staff. Um, Take the extra time to reach out to them and engage with them. If you've not heard from someone in a while um, or you're concerned about them, check in. One of the things I've also noted, I think on the OHR website is there's actually some um, tools and courses out there that supervisors can take um, to gain a little bit of experience about what it means to manage employees um, remotely. So just keep those things in mind as we, as we try to, to move towards a, a day when the campus opens back up. The other thing I'd like to talk about is um, wellness writ large and, and how we as a, a campus give back. Um, as Kate mentioned, like um, we're all in our own ways kind of heroes in this, and there's all different ways that we can give back. Um, and that helps us create, create community. Um, we can do this as an institution and as individuals. And uh, Cara, if you bring up that slide, I'll just share two examples with you. Um, You'll see there uh, John Dobley. Don, John Dobley is the uh, chair of the Department of Genetics and a faculty member there. And in late March, he was giving blood. Um, this is a time of the year when, um, you know, because people are um, being safer at home, the blood supplies are on the on the lower end. And this is a time when, if you give blood, this is a time to do that. You can you can make a schedule. You can schedule an appointment to do that. And there's other ways that we as individuals can help out, and that could be donating our time or money to, to other types of drives and efforts. The other image on the right is something we've done as a college is um, prior to um, perhaps the last few weeks, very few of us knew what the acronym PPE meant, personal protective equipment. But I will say is one of the things we've done as, as a college is really stepped up and provided um, the personal protective equipment that we have in our labs and on our stores um, to help those in um, at the hospital and other places where P 
people really need that equipment and they need it now. Um, we were there and helped and made a significant drive and push. And this was led by uh, Nick Genovese, our new safety director, um, to coordinate that on behalf of CALS. As I wrap up here, I wanna thank you um, again for your commitment to CALS, our students and the stakeholders during this really difficult time. And I will turn it back over to Kate. Great, thank you, uh, Mark. Uh, and in addition to the people who have been speaking, um, also among the uh, attendees, we have Carol Hilmer and Angie Settler and Heidi Zorb. So uh, between myself and all of the associate deans, we'll do our level best to answer what questions you have, uh, if you will send them to, to us in the chat window. Comments are also accepted, and Cara and I will kind of um, uh, moderate those and, and uh, get them out to our panelists. Uh, so just wait for a minute and see what questions you have. Um, so there's one here for, uh, on, uh, is there any word on fall semester teaching? Uh, Karen, do you want to answer that? Sure. Um, so in an answer, no. There's no, <laughs> uh, no word, but there's been a lot of discussion. Um, basically, at this point, um, there's a lot of discussion about every possible scenario we can imagine for fall and uh, how we would respond to that. So as soon as we have any clarity or we have some um, real um, directions to be heading, uh, we'll be letting you know. And I would guess that it may be yet a couple of months before we know for sure. Um, Okay, Tim Donahue has two questions. Uh, he says, uh, first of all, uh, you mentioned that many of the units responded to uh, requests from the Chancellor campus and others to donate PPE. Uh, we've been told by CALS that campuses ask for an accounting on donations. Many of my colleagues are concerned and more about this request when uh, they were doing what many would say is the right thing. Um, and uh, because we are not aware of other units asking for this information, why has Cal subjected to the request at this time? Um, I don't think that there was an objection. Tim, if I understand your, your question, and I'm going to ask Bill for some backup here, um, we, uh, this, the, the request for PPE at the beginning of uh, this shutdown period, there was a lot of confusion. And initially, uh, there was, uh, we, we were told that to keep records because uh, when the supply chain loosened up a bit, that those would be repaid. Um, I think if I'm understanding your question correctly, that's the best I can do with an answer. Bill, is there anything that you would like to add? Well, uh, in case the, the campus sent out an emergency request for, everyone across campus, not just CALS. And as far as I know, it was widely answered. Everyone from most of the departments in CALS and mo many of our ag research stations all send in their uh, appropriate PPE, most, most critically the N95 masks. And we were told at the time, uh, as you said, that folks should keep an accounting of what they donated and that when things loosened up and supplies became more reasonable that, that, that they'd be reimbursed. And I don't know if that's fiscally or back with the, you know, N95 masks and gloves and things like that, but um, yeah. I'm really proud of everyone because people came in on, I sent out the message on a Friday afternoon and Saturday morning, people were coming in socially distanced, of course, but there were chairs that were, uh, Staying all day to to manage the roundup of PPE. It was really heroic. Thanks, Bill. Um, the next question comes from Mike Bell, uh, and he asks, "What do we know at this point about the implications for international faculty, staff, and students about Trump's executive order about immigration?" Uh, of course, this is a very recent development. Um, I haven't had a chance to be in any campus conversations about it yet, but. I, I should mention that um, the deans are all meeting with the provost at least twice a week uh, and various other campus leaders are joining those conversations. So this is something we can bring forward. 
Um, we know that uh, that for people coming to campus from uh, another country, that there are going to be disruptions. Um, one area is around international graduate students uh, that would be joining us in the fall. Uh, we've been cautioned uh, to uh, expect that visa issuance may be delayed even even without this executive order. Um, and that students coming from abroad may not be able to join us until January, but there's a lot of uncertainty there. Next one is for Bill, uh, comes from Rick Lindroth, who says that federal research agencies are accommodating grant schedules with respect to COVID. Are there any plans to adjust Hatch and Max Dennis spending schedules for current grants? Uh, we started talking yesterday about what kind of flexibility we could have with our uh, capacity funds and Max Dennis and Hatch. And Rick, on NCRA calls that I've been on, um, especially the spring meeting, Tim Connor from NIFA was there. And he says that, and of course they don't have the funding, but they are trying their best to be uh, very flexible to try to keep people working and keep research going forward. And that's gonna be our mantra too. Um, Dominique asks, can we get an update on the potential furloughs? Um, I'm going to see, is Carol, uh, has Carol um, been made a panelist? If you can answer Carol, if not, I will do my best. I'm working on getting her to be a panelist. Okay, thanks, Cara. Yep. Um, so Carol uh, is just like I'm meeting with the provost. She has regular meetings uh, with Dan Walters and all of the other HR leads from schools and colleges in our units. Uh, and um, I think here's things related to HR more rapidly than I do. So Carol, you wanna take a first go at this? Good morning, everyone. Um, in regard to furloughs, there is a lot of conversation going on uh, with campus. We meet daily with the Office of Human Resources. Um, they are working on a number of scenarios, but at this point, we do not know what campus may be rolling out. We do expect to hear something soon. I wish I had more information for you, but we don't at this time. I know campus is care, uh, considering many options, Furloughs is one of them. They have not given us a laundry list of what they're thinking or what they're discussing. Uh, but at yesterday's meeting, I did get the vision uh, that we'll be hearing something soon. Um, I would say that also um, that the Board of Regents gave different authority to campus, so we do not have to uh, follow exactly what system is doing. Another questioner, uh, Sarah Gala, mentions that uh, UW system employees have been furloughed uh, for a, a couple of months, taking one unpaid day off per month. So uh, what happens there or what happens in other campuses may be different than what happens here at um, UW Madison. And I'm gonna ask Heidi, uh, to um, join us and say something about what she knows about the policy end of this. Um, and that may take a minute. Uh, so, yep, here she comes. Heidi, are you on? <laughs> yep, can hear you. Okay, great. Good morning, everybody. Uh, just a little bit of policy background on the furloughs. For those of you who were working at the university uh, the last time we were furloughed, uh, this process is different because at that point in time, uh, all UW-Madison employees were part of the state employee uh, policies and regulations according to state statute. Uh, since that time, System has been given authority to create uh, an HR system for system administration and all of the campuses except for UW-Madison and then UW-Madison has been given authority to create its own HR system. 
Uh, and so what the regents voted on last week pertains to system administration and uh, system campuses other than us. And as Carol mentioned earlier in her comments, UW-Madison leaders are processing um, what their proposal will be uh, for different aspects of our system, which may include furloughs. Um, and we are that will likely have to go back to the Board of Regents uh, for review. So it could take um, until the end of the month or early May to have some policy clarification on the direction UW-Madison will go here. Okay, um, so the next question uh, is from Alfred Hardemink, uh, and Alfred asks, will there be some sort of emergency fund after we open to pay for graduate students that did not finish, for example? Um, I think that this is something that's being considered. Um, I'm gonna ask Bill to comment as well about what he may have heard, but I've heard, heard Bill Karpus, Dean of the Graduate School, say this is something that they're they're looking at. Um, and I believe that also our federal agencies are concerned about the issue. Uh, but most of the conversations that I've been privy to are still in progress. Bill, any news? No, ma'am, I, I think that's right. There, everyone recognizes that this is a serious issue and they're all trying to figure out what to do about it. Um, Tim Donahue's second question came through also. And Heidi, I might need some help if you have any special knowledge here, but uh, he says that he's seeking advice on messaging to students and staff who are told that the campus is closed except for the for non-essential activity. And it was announced yesterday that University Ridge was open for business. That's the golf course, I believe. Uh, that he's he comments that this is a university facility, but not one that would many would classify as essential. Um, so how do we message this to people who are, are experiencing restriction from uh, being at, able to access uh, campus buildings uh, and to go about business as usual? Um, so I, I hadn't heard about University Ridge being opened. I, I know there had been some discussion about golf courses more generally. Um, so I'm gonna ask Heidi to comment on the messaging issue and then Bill, maybe you can talk about um, access to buildings for researchers and graduate students uh, and how that dovetails with uh, planning. Heidi? Yeah, thanks, Kate. Uh, um, of course, CALS wasn't involved in the decision about University Ridge operations. That's a UW athletics facility. So Tim, I will be really happy to take your question to Vice Chancellor Hoslett and get back to you when we have an answer on how they made that decision and uh, what the rationale is in a time when nearly all of our other facilities are completely closed. Bill? All of our buildings are locked, but that doesn't mean you can't go in them. You just have to maintain social distancing and be really careful. Um, we, as I said, we've approved 120 something research projects. Most of those involve people getting in their car from home and going out to the field and staying well away from their colleagues and doing their work and coming back home with only incidental ingress into the buildings. In a couple of cases in Moore Hall and Russell Labs, we became concerned about the fact that we had even though each faculty member had proposed a reduced um, activity with a lessened number of people, still in the aggregate, it could become a, a if you weren't careful, uh, uh, too many people in the same space for a virus that we still don't understand a lot about the transmission. And so we implemented uh, alternate floor access to further reduce the density of people. Um, the only other access that comes into campus now is people taking care of animals and plants and biological materials or just very incidental coming in to grab a, grab a folder or something, but that's mostly tailed off. Uh, we're keeping a very close eye on the amount of uh, activity in the buildings and the greenhouses and trying our best to let our most essential work proceed while still minimizing the risk and keeping each other safe. 
I would say that, you know, this is uh, a difficult time and policies change and guidelines change and we're doing our level best to uh, follow policy and establish uh, procedures that will keep the most people safe uh, based on information that's given to us. Um, I'm going to go to a question from Nicole Perna, uh, who says, it's great to hear that we have so many incoming uh, new faculty. What special measures will we take to help them establish their research programs if campus access is still restricted when they arrive? Uh, Mark, I'd like you to think about that. and. Um, while you're at it, you might also mention uh, the provisions for um, uh, extending the time before a tenure decision for faculty that are already here, but on the tenure track. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, uh, Nicole. I think one of the things is that we can do before they even get here is give them some flexibility on their um, uh, when their start date is. I think that's something that we could probably negotiate if they wanted to push off a later start date. Um, but I think one of the questions is, is we don't know what things are gonna look like in August. And until we have a clear picture, what that looks like, are we gonna be more back to normal operations? In which case someone would start at a, you know, it may be a little chaotic, but maybe no more than it would be chaotic for a, um, a normal incoming assistant professor. So I think it really depends what the fall semester looks like. And that's probably gonna guide the advice we might give for how do we onboard um, new assistant professors. Um, I think um, Kate raised an interesting thing. One of the things that the campus has done has allowed anyone who's in their pre-tenure time to request a um, kind of COVID-related um, extension of their tenure clock, and that's an automatic approval that would happen um, for assistant professors. And I think one of the things that we should probably try to gain some clarity on is whether that would apply to people we bring on um, in September or August. So that's a, a question that I want to I want to follow up on. So I think we'll we'll need to think about what onboarding looks like, and I would work with the individual. We'd work with the individual departments to say what what we might do for folks as they come in if we're starting up something other than full steam come um, August. Um, there are three questions at least here about returning to work and um, what can we expect when that might occur. Um, and what that transition will be like. Um, we still don't know a lot, but uh, Governor Evers has extended his uh, the stay at home uh, period, the safer at home uh, order uh, into May. And my understanding is uh, he is legally able to only propose that for a 60 day period. And so it won't be extended beyond that. So this is a very big question about what it will look like for us returning to campus. Um, and I, I think that there's work being done on that at the campus level, um, and we can share more information as we have it. I expect it's going to be a, a gradual uh, return to activities uh, with a lot of social distancing provisions still in place uh, because we are still not seeing um, a plateauing of cases at the state level. Is there anybody who would like to add to that? Yes, ma'am. I'll I'll just say that uh, at Friday, last Friday, the Associate Deans for Research met with the uh, Vice Chancellor for Research and Graduate Education, Steve Ackerman, and he's going to put a group of folks together to start talking about how we transition back to a, a more um, fully operationalized research I actually think it's probably going to look a lot like what's going on in Russell Labs and Moore Hall right now, in that we have folks coming into the building, but they're being very careful to, to schedule themselves and stay well apart from one another, sanitize common surfaces. So uh, I think that the process that, that we developed in CALS for individual lab SOPs and research requests coupled with the the traffic control that we're that we're and social distancing is probably what it's going to look like campus wide but you know one thing folks need to realize is that the medical school and cals by far have the most active research programs going right now engineering school is basically paused the letters and science is basically paused and uh, so they'll they'll be looking to the med school and to us I think it's models for how to 
begin to do research again in, in a way that keeps people safe. Um, also, you know, Karen had said something earlier about uh, looking ahead to the fall, but Karen, could you say again a little bit about the, the provost working group to look at different scenarios for uh, instruction in fall? Yeah, so there's there's been some ongoing working groups. Um, it's basically a ongoing of a, a group that's primarily academic associate deans that are involved in continuing instruction in general. So we've transitioned to how to get through the spring transition, to what the summer looks like, and discussions are just starting in the fall. So there's representation there from all the schools and colleges, uh, bringing in information from lots of other groups uh, that have this. And so again, uh, there's there's lots of discussions. I welcome input from others with ideas. Um, and again, considering we don't really know what the domain is gonna look like for the ability for students to be on campus, whether there will continue to be restrictions such as uh, by the number of um, people that can be in any gathering, um, um, the idea that uh, there may need to be other transitions through the semester, depending on um, whether students should come back, whether the virus reemerges, I mean, all kinds of scenarios. So again, lots of conversations, and I welcome all of your ideas and input too, because we really are in the let's think about every crazy scenario phase, and I know that you all are good at that too. So reach out. Um, I'm going to call on Heidi to, to say uh, what she knows about um, the, um, the ability to extend a, a, a sequester in place rule uh, and what we might expect. Thanks, Kate. Um, I, I know pretty much the same thing that all of you who are avid readers of the local news might know um and that is that uh the governor uh with the most recent extensions has actually gone beyond the 60-day emergency declaration of emergency um timeline that had originally been in place and was set to expire later this week uh so you've probably been seeing that there's been some discussion by leaders in the assembly and the state senate to potentially take a case to court uh, to, to change the parameters of the governor's plan. Um, it's completely unclear how any of that will turn out or what kind of timeline uh, any of that would be considered on. Uh, for those of you who are reading the news or who uh, actually read the governor's entire plan, you probably also noticed that post-secondary institutions, so universities like ours, would be included in what he described as the second wave of openings. Um, and of course, that plan doesn't include any specific timelines. It did uh, include a few measurable outcomes, mostly relating to increasing test capacity to 12,000 tests per day. I think we're currently around 7,500 tests per day and increasing the number of uh, folks employed either by state or county health departments to do contact tracing um, by like a magnitude, I think of a thousand people. And it's not entirely clear to me how long that process might take either. So uh, some of the next steps uh, are potentially starting to come into focus, but not necessarily with a lot of timelines attached to them, which I know is an unsatisfying answer, but it seems to be the information we have available at this time. Okay, we are um, coming towards the end. There's just, uh, I want to point out that Mark has put up the link about uh, student and employee assistance that he had mentioned when he was talking. And uh, Sarah Lean has a, a question. How will we handle an increase in people that know that they can work from home successfully? Will there be more people working from home often in the future? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I think that this is going to have an effect on how we work, how we teach, uh, perhaps our research questions. And I will be interested uh, to hear from people who supervise others um, what their feelings are about uh, more well, remote work, um, something that I have not uh, uh, engage in conversation with people about. So would we love to hear your opinions. Um, 
in some ways we'll be anxious to get back together again, but but you're right, Sarah. Uh, we, we now know we could do it and we can navigate uh, video conferencing and other tools pretty effectively. So uh, we have more time if there are more questions uh, or any final comments from any of the panelists. It looks like we might have uh, satisfied the questions that you have right now. I wanna thank so many of you from, from joining us. Our participant uh, total stands about uh, over 200 right now. So although we weren't able to see everybody's faces, it's great to see your names and, and to be able to have a chance to answer a few questions. And I look forward to continuing to work with all of you uh, as we go forward. Thanks a lot, folks, and on Wisconsin. <laughs>